Hey there. In this video, I'd like to talk about a research project that I've been working on together with David Correa Saavedra. And the project is about what's known as the asymmetric priming hypothesis. All right, so let me make this large. <clears throat> um, what's the asymmetric priming hypothesis and why is it interesting? Well, it relates to one of the leading questions of usage-based linguistics, namely how cognitive processes affect how language is structured and how language changes over time. Yeah? So in this video, I want to take a closer look at one such cognitive process, namely asymmetric priming, which has been suggested as a force that shapes language and language change. Right. Before I say anything else, let me explain what asymmetric priming actually is. If you want to, you can take out a piece of paper and um, a pen <clears throat> and think of three words that come to your mind when you hear the word paddle. All right. If you want to do this exercise, you can pause the video now. If not, uh, there will be a spoiler very soon. Okay, so <clears throat> if you do this with actual people, a frequent response is water. And you can write down in the comment section if that's actually something that you thought of or if uh, you thought of something completely different. Um, now, what do you imagine people will write down as their first association not to paddle but to water? Yeah. <clears throat> if you tell them, here's water, think of three words that come to mind when you hear it, um, you can imagine that they won't necessarily come up with the word paddle first. Yeah? So rather they'll write down things like rain or sea or drink and so on and so forth. So asymmetric priming then is when one concept or idea or word strongly primes another, yeah? so paddle strongly primes water, but the inverse isn't true. Yeah? So water only weakly primes paddle if at all. All right, so now you know what asymmetric priming is, but you're perhaps still wondering what that has to do with language change. I'll get to that in just a second. Uh, first, let me give you an overview of the next minutes. So first, I'll start with an introduction of the asymmetric priming hypothesis and its predictions. Then I will present an experimental study that addresses these predictions. I'll then continue with a second study that tests the asymmetric priming hypothesis on the basis of corpus data. And finally, I'll end on some conclusions. So without further ado, what is the asymmetric priming hypothesis? It goes back to a provocative and programmatic paper that Gerhard Jäger and Annette Rosenbach published in 2008. And in that paper, they say the following. Um, they say, we argue that the psycholinguistic mechanism of priming may account for the empirical observation that grammaticalization processes typically proceed in one direction only. And you notice that this is exactly what I talked about in the beginning of this video, this idea of usage-based linguistics, that there are psychological processes that shape how language is structured and how language changes in the long run. Right, so this got me excited. Um, they then continue and say, very generally, the prediction is that in any reported case of change where the development goes unidirectionally from A to B, A should prime B, but not vice versa. And this excited me even more because this is a claim that is really nicely testable. So let's look at a concrete example of what Jäger and Rosenbach are actually proposing. Let's say that you're out on the road and you meet a friend of yours who tells you, I'm going to the station. Yeah? The asymmetric priming hypothesis would predict that even though your friend just talked about the act of walking, uh, you'd be very likely to think about your friend's future actions. So is he going to catch his train? What is he going to do when he gets wherever, wherever he wants to go? And so on and so forth. <clears throat> Conversely, now imagine you're talking on the phone and your friend tells you, oh shoot, I'm going to miss my train. So that's a statement about the future. Hearing something about the future should only weakly, if at all, evoke the idea of your friend getting up, you know, uh, putting on shoes or whatever and walking to the station. So 
if the asymmetric priming hypothesis works in this way, then the lexical element going should prime grammatical be going to, but the reverse shouldn't be the case. So grammatical be going to should not prime lexical going. And this is something that we wanted to investigate. Yeah. So the research question in a nutshell is, does go prime be going to, but not vice versa? And if it does, then asymmetric priming would be a really uh, nice and elegant explanation for unidirectionality in grammaticalization and semantic change. Now, in order to find out whether this is actually the case, uh, David and I designed an experimental study which was meant to assess whether the asymmetric priming hypothesis actually makes the right predictions about language processing in real-life speakers. So what did we do? The first thing that we did is that we, create, we constructed a database of 20 elements that have both lexical and grammatical uses. So this well, includes things like go and be going to, but also uh, elements like have, for example. So there's lexical have uh, that expresses possession in sentences like I have a problem. Uh, but there's also grammatical have in I have solved the problem, where have is an auxiliary of the perfect. Okay, we chose 20 pairs of this kind. If you want to see the full list, you can go to our published papers and uh, the materials are all there and available. Okay, in order to test the asymmetric priming hypothesis, uh, we were interested in finding out whether there are asymmetries in the ways these elements prime each other. Yeah? So do lexical elements prime the grammatical counterparts in the same way that grammaticalized elements prime their lexical counterparts, or is there a difference? <clears throat> so how do you investigate that? Uh, the method that seemed most suitable for this purpose uh, goes by the name of maze task, and since it's not so super common as an experimental paradigm, uh, here's a little illustration of what it is. So in the experiment, Participants have two response buttons, one on the left and one on the right. You see them here on the screen. And uh, participants are given the following instructions. So they're told, in a moment, you will see two words displayed on the screen. And your task is to select one of them. And uh, a crucial bit of information is that the words you select should combine to form a meaningful sentence. Yeah? So you have two elements, pick one, and the stuff that you pick should combine to something that is an intelligible, meaningful English sentence. Okay, so on the next slide, you see how this actually works. Uh, on the first screen, you don't really have a choice. You have the and a bunch of hyphens, so you pick the. And then it gets more interesting. Uh, okay, so the sum doesn't work. The cat does work just fine. So you do uh, the cat is on the mat. Voila. So that's it. You've done it if you've uh, followed this um, little exercise. And you see that the maze task is really a mix between a self-paced reading design and a forced choice task. You have to decide on one of the elements, which is nice because it forces people to process the stimuli sentences semantically. Yeah? If they don't, uh, eventually they, they pick the wrong word. So that's good. Um, and the basic design is that subjects see screens that present two options, only one of which makes sense given the prior context. And we can measure reaction times at each step of the way, uh, reflecting where subjects have difficulties or have trouble integrating new material with old material. And this, as I will explain, can be exploited for the analysis of asymmetric priming effects. Right, so for this study, we recruited 200 speakers of American English via Mechanical Turk, and each of them clicked their way through 40 stimulus sentences, 20 of which contained a primed word, and all of this took them about 12 minutes. We only took fully correct responses, we removed outliers, and our reaction times were measured across four conditions that I will go over now. Right, um, so, in the first condition, uh, our participants saw sentences like the student kept the light on to keep reading. And uh, what's 
Specific to these stimuli is that there are two elements that uh, are related, and so lexical keep and grammatical keep, and participants see the lexical variant first. Yeah? So kept the light on is lexical keep, that comes first, keep reading comes second, and so the grammatical keep is primed by its lexical counterpart, so we call this the grammatical primed condition. The second condition is a response to a grammatical word that is preceded by an unrelated word. So in this case, the student turned the light on to keep reading. <clears throat> so here, grammatical keep is unprimed. In the third condition, uh, we have what we call lexical primed. Uh, that means that subjects respond to a lexical element, uh, such as lexical keep, that has been primed through its grammaticalized counterpart. So it's the exact opposite of the first condition. Yeah? Uh, <clears throat> the student kept checking Facebook, grammatical keep first, to keep up to date, lexical keep second. And then to make matters complete, uh, finally the fourth condition, here participants saw a lexical element that was preceded by an unrelated element, namely, uh, well, in this case, was, so this is the lexical unprimed condition. Right, what do we want to do with this? Um, well, on the asymmetric priming hypothesis, keep in the first sentence, in condition one, should yield a processing advantage over keep in the second one, because we have lexical keep priming grammatical keep. Now, if you uh, remember, this is uh, Jäger and Rosenbach's case of A priming B. Uh, so we have a unidirectional development from lexical keep to grammatical keep, and um, <clears throat> a lexical keep first should yield an advantage for grammatical keep second. Crucially, a different prediction holds for the second pair of stimuli, namely, um, <clears throat> since grammatical keep is not expected to prime lexical keep, yeah, so from B to A, there should not be any kind of advantage. So this should behave no differently from any other preceding element. Yeah? So we expect no difference between the student kept checking Facebook to keep up to date or the student was checking Facebook to keep up to date. All right, so that's the basic setup, the basic explanation for why we constructed these four conditions in this way. <clears throat> um, we only counted responses in which all words of a running sentence were selected correctly, so we made sure that people actually understood what they were saying. Uh, we also removed outlier responses that were much longer than the average, and then we took the remaining data and analyzed it with a mixed effects regression design where our reaction times were the dependent variable and our predictors were priming. You know, is it primed? Is it not primed? Grammatical? Is it grammatical or is it not grammatical? That is lexical. And we also controlled for the lemma frequency of the item in question. We further tested for two-way interactions between our predictors. So an interaction between priming and grammatical that's actually the asymmetric priming hypothesis. Yeah? So priming should yield an advantage, but only for grammatical elements, not for lexical elements. And we also controlled for an inter interaction between priming and frequency, uh, reasoning that for high frequency elements, there actually might be a ceiling effect. Um, so high frequency elements are processed so easily, they're evoked so easily, uh, maybe priming doesn't yield any advantage for them. Okay, um, participants and items we had included as random factors in the mixed effects regression. Um, what came out? Here we see the full model and the uh, first thing to tell you would be that well, all the control variables we had in the model age, gender, handedness, none of them had any significant effect, so we could throw them out. There was also no interaction between priming and frequency, so we could remove that as well and rerun uh, a minimal model of the data. So um, this gave us the results that you see in this table. Um, if you're used to looking at this, that's fine. If you're not, don't worry, let me walk you through uh, each of the four effects that we found. So the first effect concerns the priming variable. And it turns out that there is a priming effect, except it's negative. So prime forms are 
processed more slowly than unprimed forms. Well, we'll get back to this. Um, the second effect concerns the lexical versus grammatical variable. And here it turns out that grammatical elements are responded to more slowly. And also this is kind of surprising. You know, if you start from the observation that typically grammatical elements are very frequent, and so they might be processed very easily because of that. Well, here we have an effect in the opposite direction. Grammatical elements are uh, processed more slowly. <clears throat> the third effect concerns frequency, and here finally we see something that we expected, namely high frequency forms are responded to more quickly. Finally, the fourth effect is an interaction effect uh, between priming and the lexical grammatical uh, distinction. So uh, the good news would be that, hey, this is asymmetric priming. Yeah. The bad news is that uh, it works not in the way that we expected, but rather in the opposite way. Responses to grammatical forms are especially slowed down when they are primed. And what the asymmetric priming hypothesis predicts is that grammatical forms should have an advantage when they're primed, not a disadvantage. Okay, so <clears throat> you see already this doesn't exactly line up with our expectations. Um, and coming back to the uh, four conditions here, as you remember, we expected no difference between lexical primed and lexical unprimed, uh, the third and fourth condition, and uh, this prediction turned out to be correct. Yay. <clears throat> And as far as the predicted difference between grammatical primed and grammatical unprimed, we expected an advantage of grammatical primed, and not only did we not find this, uh, in fact, responses in the grammatical prime condition are slower than responses in uh, grammatical unprimed. So this works the exact opposite way of what we expected. Here you see a visualization of the latencies <clears throat> no difference between the two lexical conditions, that's fine, and a difference between the grammatical conditions in the wrong directions, and significantly so. So it's not just that the data are weird, there's a robust effect there in the wrong direction. Well, I guess that happens when you do science. Um, right, so does Go Prime be going to, but not vice versa? Uh, well, we did observe asymmetric priming effects but they don't work in the way that we expected. Priming between lexical forms and their grammaticalized counterparts is in fact negative in what we've seen. Uh, it takes longer to process a given form when it has been primed. And this negative priming particularly affects the processing of grammatical elements, so go slows down be going to more than the other way around. Okay, experimental evidence then seems to contradict the asymmetric priming hypothesis, but before giving up on it, we wanted to consider another methodological perspective, so we turn to corpora. Specifically, we wanted to find out whether grammatical forms in corpus data are preceded by their lexical sources more often than we would expect by chance. Yeah? And also, as a second question, we wanted to know whether we can use methods from distributional semantics to test the asymmetric priming hypothesis. And um, because of the second question, I'm afraid I'm going to need to take, I'll have to take a step back now and say a few words about distributional semantic methods in general. I'll eventually come back to the issue of asymmetric priming, but there are some, there's some stuff that I need to get out of the way first, so bear with me or if you know all this, then skip ahead in the video, or I don't know, watch cat videos or something. Right, so distributional semantics, just for a few minutes. Um, what is it, and why does it help us here? So on this slide, you see different words that describe things that could be found on a farm. So they're semantically related. By the same token, they are not all equally similar to each other in terms of meaning. So if you were to give these words to a human observer and uh, you were to ask them to sort these into categories, they would probably tell you that they fall into three different categories like this. Uh, animals like pig and cow and sheep, uh, 
<clears throat> uh, vegetables like carrots and potatoes and clothing items like uh, boots and shirt and and jacket yeah um, so this is what a human observer would do and uh, this here is actually something that looks like something a human being would have done but it's actually something that a computer has done so distributional semantics is a computational way of studying semantic similarity across different words. And as you see in this graph, a computer can actually be instructed to categorize our farm words in a way that is quite similar to what a human being would have done. Now, how does this automatic positioning in semantic space work? What work steps are involved? Um, there's a lot to this, but I'd like to walk you through four basic steps that um, are involved in this process. Uh, the first is the choice of a vocabulary of keywords for which you retrieve frequencies of context items from a corpus. Let me illustrate this. So in the example that you've just seen, we have these farm words. So our vocabulary that we've chosen for the analysis is a set of farm words. And in my native language, German, the word vocabulary translates into Wortschatz, treasure of words. Uh, so that's why you see the little treasure chest here. And as a first step in the procedure, we just take all these farm words and we put them into our little Wortschatz here. Okay, um, once we have that, we can take out of the Wortschatz every single item and you know, starting maybe with goat and we can choose a text corpus, no, take one like coca or the BNC or whatever and retrieve concordances for these vocabulary items. So here you see a concordance for the word goat. So several examples with context to the left and right. <clears throat> This is the basis, the, the, the basic material that the computer uses to place words somewhere in semantic space. Now, <clears throat> uh, as a first step, usually, uh, grammatical and other high frequency items are removed from these concordances. So things like pronouns or prepositions or determiners, uh, they are grayed out here. So they are so-called stop words and they don't tell us very much semantically about the keyword here. Yeah? So a determiner like the occurs with just about any noun of the English language. So we don't need it. Uh, it doesn't differentiate semantically between any of our words. So we throw it out. So we're left with a slimmer uh, concordance that is stripped of all the yeah, uh, stop words. And uh, once we have that, we can put all these context items into what we could call a bag of words that represents the context of the word goat. Yeah? So I choose the bag of words metaphor deliberately because this is what it's usually talked about. We have now a bag of words representing the word goat and uh, rather conveniently you can uh, turn this bag of words into a frequency word list. So here you see the frequency word list for goat. Goat occurs a lot with mountain in this corpus. It occurs with itself. That is uh, not a bug, it's a feature. This is something that words do all the time, lexical words. They occur with themselves. Uh, milk, cheese, sheep, meat, and so on and so forth. So this is the context for goat that from now on represents the meaning of the element goat. And we have the same for cow, we have it for pig, and we have it for trousers and, and other elements. And this is the basic information the computer works with. And the reasoning goes, that words with similar frequency lists should have some semantic relation obtaining between them. It could be that they're synonyms, it could be that they're cohyponyms, it could be that they're antonyms, that we don't know, but there should be some semantic relation between them. Okay, so that's basically it. If you followed uh, to here, you already have a rather firm grasp of what this method actually does. So we've chosen a vocabulary of keywords. We retrieved frequencies of context items from a corpus. And so we have uh, bags of words of context for all our vocabulary items. 
The second work step is basically just an arrangement of these frequency lists that you saw on the previous slide in a table of frequencies with the vocabulary items in the columns and the context items in the rows. Let me show you uh, how this works. So here we have our vocabulary items, goat, cow, pig, and so on and so forth. And we also have our context items, which already with a few vocabulary items can be lots. Yeah? So if you do concordance of goat and uh, harvest all the lexical elements that co-occur with that, you get a ton of context items. And of course, you now have the frequencies, the co-occurrence frequencies of cat and goat, of uh, goat and little, of goat and cheese, and so on and so forth. Notice that some of these cells are actually zero, as for instance in the case of cow and gray. So in our little example here, the word cow never co-occurred with the adjective gray. Yeah? So a few cows are gray, there are gray cows, but um, people in this corpus didn't care to talk about them. Right, um, so this just to make sure that not all vocabulary items occur with all context items. The important thing is now that we can compare uh, pairs of vocabulary items mathematically, just by looking at the numerical differences for each context item. Yeah? So we can say that goat and cow have a large difference for cat, they have a large difference for little, they have a large difference for cheese, they're identical for black, small difference for gray, uh, identical for cells, and so on and so forth. And uh, <clears throat> so the basic reasoning is that the summed up differences mean something. Yeah? The larger the sum of differences, the greater the semantic difference, at least in principle. Yeah? So, and you do this for pairs like goat and cow, you do this for pairs like cow and pig, and you get distances for each possible pair in the table. Now, here I uh, hastily suggested that the summed up differences equal semantic distance. It's a bit more complicated than that. So I hasten to add one thing, namely that uh, once we have completed this second work step, yeah, constructing a table of frequencies with the vocabulary items and the context items, we need to do something with those frequencies. Uh, namely, we have to transform the raw frequencies in this table uh, with a collocation measure. Yeah? So, so far our table contains raw co-occurrence frequencies of vocabulary items and context items and um, this is something of a problem. Let me explain to you why it is a problem. Um, so you notice that cow and pig with regard to gray are identical yeah? because they both have zero in the respective cells. Now this uh, turns out to be a problem when you compare low frequency words um, which tend to have lots of zeros in the cells. Yeah? So imagine that you compare two elements and most of the time you don't find a difference between, uh, because the respective cells are both zero. Now, does this really mean that they're semantically similar? Probably not. Yeah? They're just low frequency and that is that artifactually leads to a low numerical difference. Now, luckily, there's a solution available, um, namely we can take a collocation measure like pointwise mutual information, which is often used for, for this kind of purpose. And uh, this allows us to look at a co-occurrence frequency like for instance goat cheese. Yeah? We have 20 times where cheese collocates with goat. Um, and pointwise mutual information can tell us whether 20 instances of goat cheese is more than we would expect whether it's less than we would expect, or whether it's just about within what we would expect by chance. <clears throat> Let me elaborate a little bit. Uh, so I'm not going to give you the uh, formula for pointwise mutual information. You can look that up rather easily. Uh, let me just explain that this collocation measure uh, uses the marginal frequencies of the table. That is, it uses the overall frequency of the vocabulary item GOAT. Uh, you see that here, about 2000. It uses the marginal frequency of the context item CHEESE, yeah, about 10,000. And it uses this ridiculously large number here, 
uh, which represents the overall number of collocations that are contained in this table. So every possible vocabulary item with every possible uh, context item, how often do two elements occur together? And in this table, it's about 160 million. So that's a lot. Yeah. And uh, what pointwise mutual information does is that it compares this number to this number and checks the ratio and it compares this number to this number and checks the ratio and uh, so <clears throat> it checks whether the ratios are yeah disproportionate in some way now if you're like me um, you can't really see whether there's a disproportion so I, I can't do that um, but if you normalize these ratios 20 to 10,000 and 2,000 to 160 million and so uh, that gives you a table like this one here where 20 to 10,000 is about 1 to uh, 490 and 2,000 to 160 million is 1 to 80,000 and here even I can see that well the distribution is not exactly the same now and in short this means that the collocation goat cheese is much more frequent than we would expect yeah, by two orders of magnitude. And pointwise mutual information is just one calculation that can express this disproportionate uh, ratio. Okay, <clears throat> um, so that's the, the third work step, uh, transforming the raw frequencies with PMI or other collocation measures of your trust. And this brings us to the fourth and final step, namely uh, visualization. So with the table that we've created, we can create visualizations like this one that you've already seen. And uh, there are in fact many methods available that can turn a table with numerical information into a graphical display of similarity and dissimilarity like this one here. Um, so I'll refer you to either our published papers or some other sources, uh, stats, textbooks, whatnot. You can find out how this works it's not witchcraft. So how do we get back from here to asymmetric priming? We're almost there, but there's one more thing, because in order to answer the research questions that I wanted to ask about asymmetric priming, um, we needed to turn to an extension of the general technique of distributional semantics. And this extension goes by the name of token-based semantic vector space modeling. Uh, so in this graph, the graph you've just seen, every element that you see represents a word type. That is several hundred or even thousands of concordance lines of the same word. Yeah? So the position of the word cat here is determined on the basis of hundreds of different uses of the element cat. <clears throat> so for our purposes, this is a little problematic. Yeah? If we want to compare let's say lexical going and grammatical be going to, these two actually share the same form, going, and this means that the type-based approach is only of limited use. Yeah? However, there's a solution, uh, namely these token-based semantic vector spaces that I um, already mentioned. Um, these can show semantic differences between word tokens of the same type, so that each keyword token is represented by one single concordance line. And this should immediately raise a question in your mind, namely how on earth can you make comparisons based on only a handful of context items that you find in a single concordance line? Isn't this much too little data? And um, yes, that's a valid point. And there's an answer to this question, namely you don't just use the first order collocates, that is the elements that you find in a concordance line, you use second order collocates, the collocates of those collocates. Let me explain to you how this works. So in practice, what we need to construct a token-based semantic vector space are two things. And the first one is basically a type-based uh, vector space of the kinds that you've seen earlier, except this one is a lot larger than the farm word vector space with only uh, 16 vocabulary items. So here we have about 20,000 uh, vocabulary items. So this is a huge ass uh, Vodschatz. And we have as many context items. And since this table here is the basis for all the rest that is to follow, 
I'll refer to this as the mother table. Yeah? So this is the big table where everything comes from. Uh, and it's the first thing that we need. The second thing that we need are concordance lines for a word that we would like to model. So here we have a short concordance of the word since. And what we're trying to do is to create a semantic vector space that shows similarities between these five concordance lines of since. How do we do that? We first take the same step that we saw earlier, namely we exclude all the stop words that are in there. Yeah, uh, so the and genitive s and has and been and so on and so forth. And then um, we take the context items from the first concordance line. Yeah, uh, so we take advantage, we take drugs, we take toxic materials, and we put them into uh, this bag of words that represents concordance line one. And then we do something with it. Namely, uh, in order to create a semantic representation of that first concordance line, we look up its context items in the mother table. So we look up advantage, we look up drugs, we look up toxic and materials, and then we simply add an average over their collocate vectors, which gives us a single long vector, which is now our representation of concordance line one. This representation is much richer than just uh, if we were to take the four elements, advantage, drugs, toxic, and materials. It, it gives you much more information um, in terms of how similar this concordance line is to line two, line three, and so on and so forth. Right, um, so we then do the same for concordance line two, concordance line three, and so on and so forth until we have done that for all uh, concordance line. And then we actually have a table that represents all lines of our concordance. Yeah? <clears throat> and with that kind of table, we can now create a visualization of a semantic space that is populated by different tokens of the word since. So what that allows us is to map out any differences in the semantic spectrum of since. And uh, if you've looked at the examples, this concordance lines here carefully, you just might have noticed that uh, there's actually a semantic difference between the second example, the one in the middle, and the other two. Yeah? So the second since, uh, since the change of government last weekend, expresses a temporal relation, and the first and the third, they express causal relations. So, uh, for example, since drugs are toxic materials, that means because drugs are toxic materials and it has nothing to do with time. So our overall table of uh, our sense concordance has uh, columns that represent temporal sense and it has columns that represent causal sense. So this is the T1, T2, T3, uh, C1, C2, C3 that you see down here on the slide. Right, um, so this kind of table you can then um, visualize, you know, put on a two-dimensional display, and you would hope that these two different semantic categories would somehow show up in the distribution of uh, concordance lines as dot on a two-dimensional plane. So here's uh, a semantic vector space of since, and in this graph you see um, a representation of several hundred concordance lines of since, uh, some of them temporal, some of them causal. And uh, while I'll be the first to admit that there is no perfect separation of temporal and causal since, it's actually clear enough that um, the tokens of causal since, the ones in red, they are more likely to cluster in the right half of the graph and uh, temporal sense is more densely concentrated on the left. So what this tells you is uh, plain and simple, temporal and causal sense have distinct collocational preferences. All right, so this is where we finally get back to asymmetric priming. Um, now, <clears throat> as some of you may have anticipated, uh, this kind of data allows us to test the asymmetric priming hypothesis. So temporal sense and causal sense are related via grammaticalization because causal sense is a case of so-called secondary grammaticalization. Temporal sense, that was the original, the, the source, if you like, and causal sense has developed out of that. And now 
<clears throat> um, the asymmetric priming hypothesis would uh, invite you to think that temporal sense primes causal sense, but not vice versa. Yeah, so uh, remember that according to the asymmetric priming hypothesis, if two instances of sense should, in corpus data, follow one another, um, it would actually be pre predicted that switches from temporal to causal sense should be more frequent. Yeah? So uh, just by, not by chance, but uh, if we're looking at authentic corpus data and the asymmetric priming hypothesis checks out, then we should see a disproportionately high uh, frequency of switches from temporal to causal rather than the other way around. Um, then, a second uh, prediction, if we just look at the overall positions of first elements and second elements, we would expect that uh, the second elements should be somewhat more in the direction of causal sense, even if they still express temporal meaning, let's say, they should be, no, causal sense should be something of an attractor, so that causal, the, the region in semantic space where causal sense is happening, that should be the place where the second senses show up. So just to show you what kind of data we're dealing with here, um, we were looking at paired instances of sense that are between 10 and 50 words away from each other. So here's an example, let me read that out to you. India's troubled relations with Sri Lanka have improved markedly since the change of government last weekend. Mr. Ranjan, whose name I can pronounce, the first foreign minister to visit Delhi since the general election, flies home to Colombo today. So we have two senses, and in this case, we have a sequence of a prime, which expresses temporal meaning, and the target also expresses temporal meaning. But what the asymmetric priming hypothesis predicts is that more often than not, we should see a prime sense that is temporal and a target sense that is causal. And that is what we wanted to find out. All right, so let's look at the semantic vector space again. Um, so the tokens in this space, the dots that you see, uh, they come in pairs. They represent uses of sins that are maximally 50 words apart, just as in the example you just saw. And this means that for every pair in the space, we know exactly if the sequence was from temporal to temporal, from causal to causal, or whether there was a, a, a category switch. Yeah? And the arrows that you see here, they are category switches, and um, I can actually tell you they're in the minority. So the usual case is that uh, both prime and target belong to the same category. Now, what the asymmetric priming hypothesis would predict is that there should be a high ratio of switches from temporal to causal. Uh, this is not what we observe. Yeah? The numbers that you see here are the observed frequencies, <coughs> um, so 12 in this case, and in brackets you see the expected frequencies given how frequent causal and temporal since are. So, while switches from temporal to causal do happen, they happen less often than we would expect. And uh, if you look at the gray cells in the table, uh, what the table shows is that most pairs actually stay within the same semantic category. That is, we have many instances going from temporal to temporal and from causal to causal. Now, let's turn to the second prediction of the a uh, asymmetric priming hypothesis that I mentioned, which is a little less... Um, clear, let's say. So that prediction would be that primes and targets in the semantic vector space should often be semantically related in such a way that the targets are further to the right uh, than the primes. Yeah? So the, the red <coughs> attractor state of causal, since that's in the right of the graph. And so thinking of time should, at least in some instances, lead you to say something that is more, well, in accordance or, or more relatable to causal sense. So the arrows between prime and target should, more often than not, point to the right. Um, now we've checked for the direction and length of all arrows for all pairs, and it's not the case that there is a reliable drift towards causal meaning. So we have switches 
and uh, movements from so semantic leaps, if you will, from prime to target that go all over the place. But it's not that arrows typically go from left to right. So this means that on the whole, also this corpus-based example of, um, in this case, temporal and causal sense, detracts from the asymmetric priming hypothesis. Right, so we have experimental and corpus-based evidence pointing the other way, but of course you might say, okay, it's just one example and a weird one at that because uh, it's not a classic case of grammaticalization, it's the secondary grammaticalization, maybe that is weird by itself. Um, so, <clears throat> well, I, I can actually let you know that we did this for a whole bunch of pairs of uh, lexical elements and their grammaticalized counterparts. So we did this for the lexical verb used, uh, as in he used a hammer, and habitual used to, as in he used to come down here. Uh, and the results are basically the same. Uh, there's no priming asymmetry towards, in this case, habitual meaning. So here in this graph you see the primes and targets of used, and uh, red arrows go in the lexical to habitual direction that what the asymmetric priming hypothesis would predict and the black arrows go the other way and there is no um, disproportionately higher number of red arrows than than black arrows and uh, <clears throat> yeah so it's the basically same results here we see two uh, uses of the verb got so lexical got as in i got a problem and modal got to as in i got to go and also here no priming asymmetry towards modal got to and as you see the arrows are really all over the place <clears throat> uh, final example we also looked at uh, the <clears throat> english modal auxiliary may and it's different meanings. It has deontic meaning, as in you may now kiss the bride, and it has epistemic meaning, as in that may be a mistake. And again, results are the same. Arrows crisscrossing uh, the graph going all over the place. No asymmetric priming. Notice that these are not just uh, weird null results, but rather we do find robust tendencies in all of these cases. Yeah? We do find first that the semantic vector spaces allow us to discriminate between the different meaning categories. Um, so in each case, we can predict with much higher than chance whether an element in this graph is going to be either deontic or epistemic or in the previous slides, habitual or lexical and what have you. Yeah? So this works well. The method as such allows us to tease apart meanings of different concordance lines, which is kind of cool, I have to say. Um, also, we find strong effects of within category priming. If you think back to the table, so in all of these cases, in all four uh, forms that I've shown you, <clears throat> um, if you have a prime in one category, chances are that also the target is going to be in that same category. In short, priming effects are there. They're robust. They're just not the ones that the asymmetric priming hypothesis would predict. And with that, I'd now like to come to some conclusions. So, <clears throat> the gist of the priming, asymmetric priming hypothesis is that lexical going should prime grammatical be going to, whereas grammatical be going to should not prime lexical going. What actually happens is that lexical going slows down grammatical be going to, uh, whereas grammatical be going to does not do anything much to lexical going. <clears throat> How can we explain this? Um, we have an idea uh, that goes by the name of horror equi. So processing the same form twice within the space of a few words, especially when those two forms convey different meanings, that is difficult. And speakers try to avoid that at all costs under natural conditions. So let me show you uh, some of the example sentences that we tortured our participants with. Uh, the boys need two sh new shoes that we need to buy. This is terrible. You know, this is nothing that anyone uh, would say under normal conditions. Um, here's a different one. You need to make a list of things you need. <clears throat> now, notice that the sentence with the boys is really horrible, yeah? and uh, the sentence with the list of things is actually quite okay. 
Um, well, turns out that, uh, well, the boys' sentences, here we have lexical need first and then grammatical need second. And in the second list of things sentence, we have grammatical need first and lexical need second. So apparently if you have the grammatical element first, it's not quite as bad. And um, <clears throat> this holds uh, the potential for an explanation. Um, so you could ask, if horror equi has a role to play, why should there be this asymmetry between grammatical elements and uh, lexical elements? And the explanation would be that, well, semantic specificity may actually have something to do with this. So, um, fading of horror equi is actually a diagnostic of grammaticalization that, for instance, uh, people like Bernd Heine have talked about. So at some point, uh, have <clears throat> became grammaticalized to such a degree that it was possible to say things like, my parents have had a dog without anyone even blinking. Yeah? I'm going to go there, not a problem. Yeah? So when you have strongly grammaticalized forms, you can use them with their lexical sources without any sort of problem. Um, the same isn't quite true of only weakly grammaticalized elements. So he used to use a typewriter. Um, that's maybe okay. Yeah? So it's not cringeworthy, but it um, has the potential of throwing you off just a little bit. It happened to happen on a Tuesday. That sounds like you're trying to be funny uh, or original in a non-funny way. But I guess this is something that if you were to write this in an essay, uh, someone would go and get out the red pen or something. So, um, moving on then, what we found in the corpus-based tests of the asymmetric priming hypothesis is that lexical forms strongly prime themselves and grammatical forms prime themselves. So, uh, that means when there is no difference in the meaning that a form is used with, then uh, there is no horror equi or anything, but just people go with the flow and uh, you know, even self-prime uh, <clears throat> the use of the same form over again. So we find self-priming of both lexical forms and grammatical forms, but crucially no priming asymmetries towards the more grammatical variant. So in conclusion then, both the experimental results and the corpus-based results detract from the asymmetric priming hypothesis. And uh, while this is kind of disappointing, yes, uh, I, I had high hopes for this, um, what can you do? Importantly, it does not call into question this basic tenet of usage-based approaches that, uh, let's say, psychological processes, cognitive biases, operating in the here and now shape language structure and language change. Um, it just means that asymmetric priming is not the explanation for unidirectionality and semantic change that we may have been looking for. All right, on this note, I'd like to end, not without giving a shout out to uh, David, who's been involved in this work and who continues to work with me. All right, thanks for watching. And if you have comments, you know, leave them in the comment section or get in touch. And uh, we're super happy to talk to you about these things. Thanks and goodbye.